All right. <laughs> um, Jim with Cyber Recon, and we're going to jump into looking at the pass the hash attack. So let's jump into the slide deck. This is part of your Security Plus preparation. This is part of Domain 1, compare and contrast types of attacks, uh, subdomain 1, 2 types of attacks, and this is the pass the hash attack. So we talk about pass the hash attack, we definitely have to you know, talk about how hashing works and how, how this can be manipulated, right? First, we need to talk about what a hash is. So hash and hash is a one-way mathematical function that creates a string of characters that represents that object. So the object itself can be a picture, a file, a password, really anything. But we're going to try and come up with a mathematical calculation that's going to be a string of characters that's going to represent that object and the way that the math works it can't really well, it can't be reversed if it works good it can't be reversed to find out the original thing so if we encrypt or if we excuse me if we hash a password when we there should be no way to un unhash that to come back up to the the password so we shouldn't be able to reverse a, a good hashing function right the hash is not an encrypted version of the object it's just a representation of the object and it's making sure that if anything in that object changes, the hash will no longer be valid. So that the hash is a true representation of that object. It can't be reversed. We can't figure it out, right? The other thing we want to make sure is that two hashes, hashes of two different objects, should, shouldn't be the same, right? So when we hash two different things, like two different passwords, it should never, ever result in the same hash being created, right? And that happened with MD5. MD5, we could in some cases, hash two different things, and it would end up with the same hash value. And that's called a collision. So again, some a term you need to know, when, when a hash value is created, and they call that the message digest, right? The hash value is really called the message digest. When two message digests representing two different objects end up with the same hash, that's a bad thing. We never want that. And this, this past the hash, vulnerability has really been fixed in Windows 10. So it really doesn't exist so much anymore. The problem is there's a lot of systems out there that are not upgraded to Windows 10 yet. So in Windows, uh, especially Windows workstations before Windows 10, and I'm going to stop saying that, just in, in Windows, the password hash is stored in a service called lsas.exe. And it's stored in memory an application is called the Local uh, Security Authentication Server, and I think service is the last S. It stores the NTLM hash of the user's password. So it doesn't store the password in memory, but it stores that representation of the password in memory. So in this case, Alice uses the very, very secure password of Alice, and then N NTLM hash of Alice is rep represented on the slide right here. So if you look, look there, <laughs> that is Alice hashed using the NTLM hash, right? So, and this is stored in memory. So Alice, the username, her, her username in this case, very, very secure because her username is Alice and her password is Alice. Very bad security practices, of course. So this is stored in memory. So when we look at it, we look at the way that this single sign-on request to objects. And that's really why we have LSAS, is so we can log on to our computer one time, and then we can access different objects across our network, right? So if you log on to a machine, your logon hash and username are kept in LSAS.exe in this, this program, right? It's stored there. It's stored in memory. So it, when you log on, as long as that computer has been re rebooted, whoever has logged on to that, their credentials will be stored in this program. You have to be a, a local administrator to be able to see this program, but a lot of times we assign people local administrator rights uh, to make things easier. That's the one of the downfalls of this environment. A lot of times we have this conflict between ease and security. So this is one of the times ease is going to get us in trouble, right? So if we allow too many people to be local administrators, so administrators on their local machine, not administrators on the domain, just administrators on their local machine. If that system is compromised, then we can have access to this whole 
list of hashes that's included in this program. So you can see here, Alice, Bob, and Dan have all logged into the, the system. Their NTLM password hashes are all stored in LSAS, and their usernames are all stored in LSAS. So normally, the way this is going to work, Alice is going to say, hey, I need to get some files, right? So she's going to connect to a file server. She's going to send a request over asking to get connected to the file server and to use that resource. I'm going to move myself to the other side here. And what's going to happen is that server, that file server, is part of Active Directory, right? So it's going to send a challenge back. And the challenge is going to be a random 16-byte number that that file server remembers, right? So it's going to, it's going to know what the, mem the number it sent over is. So now it's got Alice's username, and it's got this 16-byte number. So the response is going to come back from Alice to the file server to get her access. And what she's going to do is she's going to send a response. And the response is going to be that same challenge that was sent by the file server. But now it's going to be encrypted with her password hash. Not her password, but her password hash. So that's going to be a response goes back. Now the file server has her username, the challenge that was initially sent, and then the response, which is that challenge, encrypted with the hash of Alice's password, right? That's, uh, you know, crazy stuff going on here. So now the file server is going to connect to Active Directory because Active Directory is where we're going to validate that Alice has permission to use this, the service, has permission to access these files, and figure out all of her permission levels. So first, the, the file server will send the username, the NTLM hash, plus the challenge. And that's, that's the NTLM hash of the challenge and the password. So that's really the, the hash that was sent back from Alice. I want to make sure that's clear. It's not her NTLM password hash. It's her username and that response to the challenge. So the NTLM hash of the challenge plus the challenge itself. So I want to make sure you don't get confused there. It, it's not the hash of her password because that file server has no idea what the hash of her password is. That's the way this is designed. So it's just the NTLM hash, which is the hash of the challenge using Alice's password hash from her computer. So the response essentially from her computer. So Active Directory also has a copy of all of the users within the domain, their username and their NTLM password hash. So the domain server can go through the same process. It can take the challenge and it can encrypt it with the hash of Alice's password and should come up with the same response. And that's why the file server sent that response that was got that was received from Alice to the domain controller. If the domain controller looks at those and they all match up, then this domain server will say, it's okay, Alice can access those files. So what we've done is on, on the, initially we sent from the file server to Alice a challenge after she requested access. She encrypted that challenge with her NTLM password hash and sent it back to the file server. The file server sent that response, the challenge, and the username to Active Directory. Active Directory validated that it was all good to go. And then Alice got access to the file server. So in the attack, we can we can exploit this, this, this setup if we do things right. So Hank the Hackers here hacks Alice's computer. And that's the first step, we have to get some way to get that local admin, right? So computer becomes compromised. Hank is able to get the NTLM hashes from Alice's computer. That's the first step. And really, we don't want Alice's hash. We want Dan's hash because Dan is a domain admin. And a domain admin has a whole lot more power. But we can't get directly to Dan to get his hash from his server because maybe he's really secure. But he's had to log on to Alice's computer, and Alice maybe is not so secure. Uh, on her computer in LSAS is Dan's password hash. So um, Alice is the local admin, Dan is the domain administrator, and Hank is going to steal Dan's domain hash from Alice's computer. All he has to do is pass that off as if, as if he's Dan. So he'll send a request to create a domain administrator account. The domain admin uh, the domain server, domain controller, will stand, send back that challenge. And Hank here is acting as Dan, right? So he's going to send over a request saying, hey, I'm Dan, uh, create this new admin account. 
the domain controller will send back a challenge. Hank, acting as Dan, will encrypt that challenge using the password hash of Dan's password that he just stole from Alice. And then the domain controller will create the account. Normally, we've got logging and stuff going on, so this may get noticed really quick. But maybe we can do something like elevate our account we've already got to a domain admin. And then it, it becomes <laughs> game over. Now, now Hank has domain level privileges on this network. So that's the way this thing works. That's why this is so dangerous. Pass the hash is, is it's, I'm glad they've fixed it on most Windows systems. But remember, a lot of the legacy systems are out there in the environment. So when you find those older Windows 7 and Windows 8 boxes, they're still uh, exploitable by this thing and, and server like 2012 as well. So that's, that's a rundown of Pass the Hash. Uh, let me know what you think. Like, comment, subscribe, hit the bell to be notified. I'd love to hear what you think about Pass the Hash. Did this make sense? Do you understand it? Uh, if not, do we need to expand a little more? Let me know in the comments below. But as always, I'm Jim with Cyber Recon. Uh, be safe out there.